Mm -hmm. Praise God. You may be seated. I, uh, I just want to say that it's so precious uh, and important to honor the patriarchs of the faith. And, you know, I just want to say to Sister Gracie that your ministry is not over yet. You may not be in the front of the battlefields, but your experience and the wealth of knowledge and wisdom that has been accumulated in you through the years is invaluable. And you need to impart that now to the new generation and pass on many of these jewels because they are important. And these things that you learned, you know, many times people don't understand that the things you learn as you go through the years, the battle, the scars, the lessons you learn in life, those things are dear and they're very, very powerful and uh, they can be passed on to another generation so they don't have to go maybe through all the heartaches and the pains of learning these experiences on their own. So, amen. It's not over until it's over. Praise God. Same goes for Brother Rudson and Sister Rudson. And, you know, <clears throat> as I grow older, I become painfully aware of uh, old age. And, uh, you know, not sickness because the Lord has blessed me with good health. And, um, but, you know, the aches and this and that, that that come with old age, you know, you just can't escape that kind of stuff. And so I have become painfully aware of these things. And one thing I always tell the Lord is I want to finish my race strong and well. And when I get over to the other side of the Jordan, I want to hear the words, well done, faith and good servant, faithful servant. And so... You know, uh, I want to impart uh, what the Lord has given me onto a younger generation, young warriors that God is raising up. And that is part of our ministry is it's to empower and equip and train young, new emerging leaders. You know, Moses had his Joshua's, and uh, Elijah had his Elisha, and uh, Jesus has his disciples, you know, and so it is part of of, um, of discipling is part of passing on the baton, if you will. And uh, we are in a very important time right now where it seems like <laughs> evil is <laughs> everywhere. We've never seen the things we are seeing in this country, especially. Uh, we are seeing, now we've never seen any of these things in this country. And so <clears throat> it is time for a new generation to rise up and when I look at, at, at Christy and uh, many of these other young people, and I travel and I see many young people emerging and just seizing, seizing this thing, you know, by the, by the horns, the bull by the horns and going, you know, we need to. We need to train them and we need to be patient with, uh, with a young generation because there's a process involved of learning and growing and maturing. And um, <clears throat> I remember I made many mistakes when I was young in the Lord. I made many mistakes, and um, it is part of growing. So you have to give grace to others so they can grow, and then you have to give yourself grace so that you can grow. Don't be too hard on yourself. Amen? Amen. So <clears throat> how many of you were here last night? Praise God. Well, if you were not here, Oh, you missed something <laughs> because we had quite, quite a time in the Lord. And um, I, I was talking to Pastor Lynn, and he was telling me that, and Sister Renee, that, that they left close to midnight or, or past midnight, and I left close to 11. I was wiped out. I hit the bed like a rock, and I... I couldn't, I couldn't do much else, just lay there. And, um, you know, uh, so I pray that you come tonight uh, to fire in the valley. I truly believe we had quite a fire last night. And, uh, <laughs> and so 
Praise God. The Lord has blessed this church. This church is being prepared to experience a fresh move of the Spirit. And, um, and Sister Gracie was standing here sharing that this thing is not new. I, I know. I know that those Brush Arbor uh, revivals back then and uh, camp meetings and, I mean, they went, they went home till you know, 12 midnight later. People getting healed, people getting set free, people being born again, filled with the Spirit, you know. And uh, this, this, is the way, this is the way it was. This is the way it was. And uh, the church today has gotten away from that. You know, we become kind of more kind of settled. <laughs> and, uh, but this, this, is the way, this is the way churches were sprouting all over the, the country back then during the Azusa Street revivals, the miracles that happened in Azusa. We, we haven't seen them replicated yet. The miracles, I'm talking about creative miracles, uh, arms growing. Uh, uh, I'm talking about eye, eye, eyeballs growing in the socket. I'm talking about genuine miracles. We're going to see those again. Praise God. We're going to see those again in the name of Jesus Christ. And uh, I, have seen, I have seen dreams the Lord has given me, visions the Lord has given me, where we were having revivals and there were dozens, hundreds maybe of homosexuals coming to the Lord, weeping, repenting, crying. Yes, yes, yes. And, uh, you know, they're coming out of the closet, but it's time for the church to come out of the closet too. <laughs> Praise God. Praise God. It's time for the church to come out of the closet because we have been hidden Christians. We have been kind of a secret Christians too long. And, you know, we need to be the salt and light of the earth. When we go to a restaurant, we need to pray and we need to, you know, pray out loud and pray for people around us and not be ashamed, not be embarrassed of our heritage, of who we are in Christ Jesus, our identity. Praise God. You'll be surprised. You'll be surprised. We were, uh, we were in uh, St. Augustine not long ago with a, a friend of, uh, some friend of ours, and we were talking about the things of the Lord, and we were talking about Jesus Christ, who he, who he is, and who he, he said to his disciples he was. And there was this man sitting over there in another table, and he overheard me, and he said, Preach it, brother. Amen. And, <laughs> and pretty soon, you know, there was a lot of people joining in, and you know, we need to do this. This country needs this done. This country is being swallowed by the, the belly of hell. And we need to rise up and let them know that, hey, there are still some sons of God and daughters of God that are not given up yet. And we are not about to give up. Praise God. And, um, you know, this is, this is something that it, it is extremely important. Extremely important. And uh, I'm going to give you a word today uh, that, that from the Bible. But um, I just want to share before I do that, that tonight we'll have baptism after the service starting at 6. Amen? Not 7, 6. And then if you are in the list to be baptized, you need to bring a change of clothing with you. We'll have the towels, so you don't have to worry about that. But you need to bring a change of clothing with you. And if there is anyone else, maybe you came in late, maybe you came in Saturday late, uh, and you want to be baptized in the water in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, sign your name on that list. Sister Renee has the list. Right, Sister Renee? You see her right, sitting right there. That's Pastor Renee Hardy. And just get with her, and she will write your name so we know how many are supposed to be baptized tonight. We have a good, li a good list already, so praise God. Um, I bring, bring you greetings from my family, my wife, my son, my daughter, my grandson, Asher. He's a, he's a little, I mean, he's something else, a little boy. And... Um, I bring you greetings from the saints in Florida, 
And we may have we may have a conference in Florida sometime. Amen. Amen. Praise God. I've been having a lot of requests. Brother Augusto, when are you going to do one in Florida? I can go to Idaho. I can go to Seekonk. So we're praying about that too. Praise God. Praise God. All right. Now, if you have your Bibles, go with me. We're going to read t- this morning. Um, we're going to read this morning in the book of Joshua, chapter 3. Praise the Lord. Book of Joshua, chapter 3. <clears throat> And we're going to read, starting in verse 1. Praise God. If you didn't bring your Bible with you, you can slide over to somebody that has one. Or maybe you have the modern uh, Bible, your iPod, iPad. Yeah. Praise God. And Joshua rose early in the morning, and they removed from Shittim, and came to Jordan, he and all the children of Israel, and lodged there before they passed over. And it came to pass after three days that the officers went through the host. And they commanded the people, saying, When you see the ark of the covenant of the Lord your God, and the priests, the Levites, bearing it, then you shall Move from your place and go after it. Yet there shall be a space between you and it, about 2,000 cubits by measure. Come not near unto it, that you may know the way by which you must go. For you have not passed this way before. Underline that in your Bible. You have not passed this way before. And Joshua, verse 5, said unto the people, Sanctify yourselves, for tomorrow the Lord will do wonders among you. And Joshua spoke unto the priests, saying, Take up the ark of the covenant and pass over before the people. And they took the ark of the covenant and went before the people. And the Lord said unto Joshua, This day will I begin to magnify thee in the sight of all Israel, that they may know that as I was with Moses, so will I be with thee. And you shall command the priests that bear the ark of the covenant, saying, When you are come to the brink of the water of Jordan, You shall stand still in Jordan. And Joshua said unto the children of Israel, Come hither and hear the words of the Lord your God. And Joshua said, Hereby you shall know that the living God is among you, and that he will without fail drive out from before you the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Hivites, the Perizzites, the Gigashites, the Amorites, the Jebusites. Behold, the ark of the covenant of the Lord of all the earth passes over before you into Jordan. Praise God. And Father, we just bless your word tonight, uh, this morning in the precious name of your beloved son, Yeshua, Jesus Christ. Thank you for what you've done. Thank you for what you did last night, Friday night. Saturday morning, and Lord, tonight what you're about to do. Thank you for this house. Thank you for the people, Lord, here. Thank you for what you're doing in Valley Church, Pentecostal Church. Thank you for, Lord, the the things you're about to bring to pass here, Lord. And you're, you're about to bring in a harvest in this latter days. In the mighty name of Jesus Christ, we bless you, we praise you, And we give you all the glory for all things in Jesus' name. Praise God. Praise God. I'm going to talk to you this morning about the theme, It's Time to Cross the Jordan. Now, the River Jordan 
throughout the Bible is known as a place of change. Place of change. River Jordan is has a lot of, a long history. A long history. That's where Moses baptized, uh, where uh, uh, John baptized Jesus. It was where also Jacob, just east of the Jordan, where he wrestled with the angel of the Lord, and his name was changed from Jacob to Israel. The Jordan has a long history, and it always has been identified with change. And so when we read here the scripture, it talks about the Levites going before the people. The Levites represent the ministry, represents the fivefold ministry, going before the people, and they carry the ark on their shoulders. The reason it specifies that they carry the ark on their shoulders is because shoulders represent government and also intimacy. And they carry the ark of the covenant, which represents the presence and the glory of God on their shoulders. They were supposed to carry them on, on, you know, on those long wooden, uh, what do you call them, rods, and the ark was there. It had to be done this way. Whenever Israel tried to change the method and began to carry the ark like the Philistines on a cart, the glory of God smote Uzzah, killed him when he tried to settle the ark that was kind of shaken on the, on the cart. And uh, the people became scared. And uh, even David became concerned because the ark had killed one of his men for doing nothing, just touching the ark. But he did something that was not supposed to do. The ark was not supposed to be touched by anyone. No one can touch the glory of God. You cannot touch the glory of God. It can kill you, like I was teaching you last night. Back, especially back in the days before Jesus came. And so they took the Ark of the Covenant to the house of Obed-Edom. They just kind of put it there, you know, kind of, uh, <laughs> we're going to leave the Ark here. <laughs> I hope they don't kill you, <laughs> Obed-Edom. <laughs> but we ain't taking the Ark with us because it uh, is dangerous. Well, they found out that after a while, the house of Obed-Edom began to be blessed mightily by the Lord. He had the Ark of the Covenant in his house, and he was being blessed. Now, that tells me something right there, a very important message right there, and then we're going to go back to the Jordan, but uh, I need to explain this. Why did Obed-Edom... Why was his house blessed and, you know, nothing bad happened? Nobody got killed. His house was blessed. What was it about Obed-Edom and his house that was different? And when David saw that, then he wanted to bring the ark, you know, with him to Jerusalem. And <clears throat> I will say this, and the Bible doesn't say why. But I will say this, I believe Obed-Edom knew how to entertain the glory and the presence of God in the right way, in the right form, in the right protocol. <clears throat> there is a way to entreat the presence of God and the glory of God, and there is a way not to. You want the presence of God in your homes? Raise your hands. Well, there is a way to do it, and there's a way not to do it. And uh, if, you, <clears throat> if, if you entertain the presence of God and the glory of God in a, 
in an irreverent manner and in an unholy manner. It's not good. It's not good. And so, you know, we live in a time when we need the presence of God in our home. We need the presence of God in our home. And that there is a way to make him feel comfortable, make him feel, if you will, welcomed in our home, in our lives. And there is a way not to make him feel welcome in our home, in our lives. And so, <clears throat> you know, one of the things that we have lost as believers and as sons and daughters of God is we have lost the fear of God. Now, let me say this. There is a big difference between the anointing and the glory. The anointing comes for service. It comes on a person to minister salvation, healing, deliverance. It's, it's an anointing of service, okay? And it, it is given by the Lord for that purpose. We talked about it last night. However, the glory, something else. When the glory shows up, <laughs> it puts a fear of God in people. It puts a fear of God in people. And uh, I have just caught brief glimpses of it. And it is, it is an awesome thing. And we're going to see this in the latter days. The glory of God shall be revealed. <clears throat> I have seen this happen not many times, just a few times. We saw this in Honduras. A, a, a very large church, about 2,000 people strong. And now they're probably up to 3,000. And uh, I remember <clears throat> I told the people in the evening service, the pastor of the church got up and said, the Lord is about to do something special here tonight. He, gave, he showed her a rainbow. And she said, I don't know what it is, but something is going to happen. Well, the, you know, musicians came, they worshiped the Lord. And uh, <clears throat> when it came my time to share the word, as I stood there, I felt like the Lord had not been welcomed properly. You know, the music was fine. There was nothing wrong with the music. The worship was fine. There was nothing wrong. It was just I had the sense in my spirit that the Almighty had not been welcomed properly. There is, people, a right protocol to enter into the presence of a king. You cannot enter into the presence of a king uh, irreverently. And this is the difference, again, between the anointing and the glory. Okay, when the king enters a place, like in Isaiah 6, and his entourage enters with him, the angels of the Most High enter with him, and his glory fills the temple, you know, and his train fills the temple, you know, the train is not a choo-choo train, is the, the glow, the, 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 the afterglow of his glory, the, the, if you will, the the waves of his glory that follow him when he comes, when it enters a place, something happens to the atmosphere. It changes. What happened to Isaiah? And I don't know why I'm going to in into this direction, because I got away from my text. <laughs> but you have to follow the Holy Spirit, right? Wherever he leads me. And so I am going to follow the anointing wherever he leads me. So <clears throat> when, I, when, he, when Isaiah was there, and Isaiah was a mighty prophet of the Most High God, he was considered one of the elders of the prophets. 
He ministered to kings. He was an advisor to kings. He was a man considered a holy man, a man of God. And yet, when this man of God, Isaiah, when he was there and he experienced the, the presence of Almighty God, the glory of God, when, the, when the, the angels of the Lord began to cry, Holy, 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 holy. Can you imagine the atmosphere there? Isaiah <clears throat> says in Isaiah 6 that he, he, just, he just was broken. And he began to see things in him that he never saw before. Now, how can that be, Brother Augusto? Listen to me. There are things and there are levels in each one of us that we have never seen before. But <clears throat> we, don't, we don't see it in, in normal light. But as the light intensifies from 100 watts to 300 watts to 500 watts to 1,000 watts to the sunlight, we see things that we, we were not able to see in, in this other light. And that is called the glory of God. And when the glory of God manifests, we are able to see things in us and things are revealed in us that we never saw before. And this is what Isaiah experienced. Isaiah saw himself as a man of unclean lips. Can you imagine this? If Isaiah thought he was a man of unclean lips, one of the most righteous men alive back then. Now, I say this to tell you something. When the angel of the Lord took the tongues and brought a, a burning coal of fire from the altar and placed it on his lips. Psh, have you ever smelled the, the smell of burning flesh? It's, I mean, <laughs> it, it, it's something, something different. You know, there are things, there are spiritual things that we just don't understand. Like the, the other time in the book of Revelation where the, the angel gave a little book to John and said, Eat the scroll. It's going to be sweet in your mouth like honey, but bitter in your belly. There are things that when we receive it are sweet in our mouth, but it then becomes bitter because the process begins. And it is not easy to walk it through. Praise God. Sometimes the Lord brings us to a place where it is hard to go through, but it is for a divine purpose and a divine uh, appointment. And, um, you know, we are going to see people, we are going to see the glory of God manifested in these last days. He says in the book of Isaiah, chapter 60, that there will, be, there will come gross darkness upon the earth. I have been shown this. It's already begun. But we haven't seen the full manifestation of it yet. But as this gross darkness happens, which already happened in Egypt, in the book of Exodus, the Bible says that there was gross darkness in all of Egypt. And the darkness was so thick, it had substance. It says so in the Bible. It was so thick. A darkness that you can touch. This, these are the words written in the Bible, in the book of Exodus. A darkness you could touch. But it was in that darkness that the Lord manifested himself in all his glory. 
our last newsletter we sent out, we sent out a newsletter every quarter or so. I titled it, The Glory and the Darkness. The Glory and the Darkness. And uh, <clears throat> when it gets really dark, and it is going to get very dark, like they say nowadays, you ain't seen nothing yet. I mean, I, I never thought I would live to see the day when they would celebrate a black mass openly in, in the United States, like in Oklahoma. I would have never, if, they, if you would have told me that 20 years ago, even 10 years ago, I would have said, no, no, that's impossible. Yet it's happened. It's getting, this thing's getting pretty dark. But as it gets darker, the Lord has promised that his glory will be revealed as well. Just like where there's much sin, there more grace abounds. Where there's more darkness, the more glory abounds. And in Exodus, now listen to, listen to this and keep it in your heart. In Exodus, the darkness descended in all of Egypt except in Goshen. Except in the land of Goshen where God's people were. None of the plagues affected them except the first three, I believe, which were the lighter ones. When it started getting really bad, those that were in Goshen were protected. How were they protected, Brother Augusto? They were instructed through Moses, God's servant, to place blood on the doorposts. They were instructed to get all the leaven out of the house. They were instructed to roast the lamb and eat it whole. Not to leave any part of it out. What are you saying, Brother Augusto? What is the significance of this? They were told to have their loins girded. Their feet, their shoes on their feet. Ready to move. They were told that they was going to pass the angel of death, the destroyer, through the land of Egypt. But those that had the blood on the doorpost would be protected. Do not take this for granted. You have to apply the blood. I've been telling you this this last three days. This thing is not automatic. Smile, Jesus loves you. The price has been paid. The sacrifice has taken place. He died for our sins. He was beaten and 39 stripes on his back. But you have to apply these principles to your life. You have to apply the blood to your life. You have to apply these things to your life. It is not automatic. And when this thing happened, they were protected. The Lord knows how to protect his people. I was told by a messenger from the Lord, this great darkness is coming upon planet Earth. Three times. Now, I, when, I, when that happened to me, I was disturbed. Why would the Lord send a messenger to tell me that? I know it's getting dark. I know things are bad. Why would he, why would he do this? What is he, what does he mean? What is he talking about? 
People, we have seen many things during our lives. Many bad things. I'm sure Brother and Sister Rutson have seen some bad stuff during their lives. Sister Gracie and many of the elders here and that have gone before us. But I'm telling you, we have never seen the things that are about to happen. Never. The level of wickedness, the level of evil, we have never seen before. In the book of Revelation, the Lord told one of the churches, he calls it the depths of Satan. That's what Jesus Christ called it. The depths of Satan. People, there are, there are things so evil, so wicked, so, so dark. We're beginning to see a smattering of it now over in Iraq and Syria and uh, even in the United States is beginning to come on. I'm telling you, I was told that there was great darkness coming. But the same messenger told me, there's a lot of activity taking place in heaven right now. Activity for what? Let me tell you something. I share this. I believe it was one of the this last couple of days. There has been a shift in the atmosphere in heaven. There is an urgency in heaven to bring in the harvest. Early this year, the Spirit said to me, "Bring in the harvest. Save the lost at any cost." This is when he instructed me to begin to put the intercessors together, to begin to go and do these conferences. It's time to bring in the harvest, to train the people, prepare the people. There's a lot of activity going on in heaven. Heaven has, the atmosphere in heaven has shifted. There is a battle coming. The Lord has arrayed himself in a battle array. <laughs> You know, the, he's also called the Lord, of, the Lord Shabbath, the God of war. We are about to see the God of war. We are about to see the great almighty take the, his sword from his sheath. The word from his mouth, which is so powerful that it will smite the enemy like a sword, the two-edged sword. And he's raising up a, my, uh, an army of his warriors on this planet. The enemy's got his. We're, we're not going to talk about him. But what you need not forget is the Lord has also his plans. He also has his mighty warriors. Oh, praise God. And so, there is going to be an increase. I said all this to tell you this. There is going to be an increase in the level and intensity of God's presence. And if you are not wired correctly, you won't be able to handle it. If you have... If you have issues in your life, you have problems and sin and junk, garbage, leaven. One of the things that people were told is get the leaven out of the house. This text we just read, the Lord instructed Moses and there in Joshua. He said, and in the book of and Joshua said, sanctify yourselves. I said it last night. I'm going to say it again. Sanctify yourself. 
Well, brother Augusto, if the Lord wants me, you know, uh, sanctified, he'll do it. No. No. You have to sanctify yourself. Sanctify means separate yourself. Set yourself apart. You have been bought with a price. You don't belong to yourself anymore. You're not yours to do whatever you want with your life like you think you can. You belong to one that bought you. Well, I don't like that concept, Brother Augusto. You don't like the concept, maybe that part, but how about you like the concept that he has a covenant with you that everything he has and everything that he owns belongs to you too? Do you like that concept, right? Do you like that one? How many like that one? How many like that one that he's going to bring us into his home and he's going to share his glory with us? How many like that concept? How many like the concept that all the riches of heaven and the wealth and the power and the glory he's going to share with those that belong to him? How many like that one? How many like the protection that comes with being associated with him? How many like the provision that comes as being associated with him? That's part of the covenant. A covenant takes two parties. When you make a covenant, you covenant together. There was a right in the old days in Africa, still do it, where people that became covenant brothers, they sliced their flesh and put the blood together. They became covenant brothers, blood brothers. Everything that this one owned became the other's possession, and vice versa. That is covenant. We don't talk about covenant anymore. Covenant means that you don't belong to yourself. You belong to him. But he belongs to you too. That means that everything you have is his. Well, I don't like that part. <laughs> but everything that he has also is yours. This is how this works. This is not a one-way street. Covenant requires commitment. Commitment, I, sh I shared this before, requires sacrifice. And sacrifice many times brings pain. Commitment requires giving up things we don't want to give up. Commitment requires doing things we don't want to do. Commitment requires enduring things we do not want to endure. But when we do, we reap great rewards, not just in the everlasting life, but here on planet Earth too. All men of God, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Moses, Joshua, they went through layers of testings. In order to achieve a status with the Almighty, you are obedient in this level. He says, okay, you passed the test. I'm going to bring you to another level. Let's see how you do here. You walk in that level and you pass the test of that level. You're faithful. You are committed. You do what you have been told to do by him, not what you want. Okay, you have passed the test. I'm bringing you to another level. There are levels of obedience and there are levels of walking in the Lord. And if you want to go to another level, there will be more required of you. Why? Because the greater the level and the more authority you receive also requires more commitment. It requires, uh, uh, if you will, more accountability. 
To whom much is given, much is required. Oh, Brother Augusto, Brother Perez, but I don't want to have all that. Okay, you don't have to. You can still go to heaven without having to do anything. But when you get there, you're going to be sorry. You're going to be sorry you, you prefer to play all day long and waste on too many. You know, waste your time and not do what you needed to do. When you get over there, you're going to be sorry. And this is where the Bible says he will wipe the tears away from his lambs over there. When they see, oh, my Lord, I wasted my lifetime. I could have done so much. And the plans you, have for, you had for me, and I squandered it. But you'll still be there, but it will not be the same. And so, and on this earth too. And so this is one concept that the church has lost. This, this, this thing that is, and, and I, I'm, I am old-fashioned. I, I go by the word. I, go by, I, st I, am a, I am a stickler to the word. I am a student of the word. And I am, I am a servant of the Lord. And I obey him. And um, people, we're going to see the glory of God. And uh, if you want to go higher, you can go higher. You can go, how high can I go, Brother Perez? You can go as high as you want to. There is no limit to how much of God you can have in your life. There is no limit to how much you can grow. There is no limitation. There's none. How close can I get to the Lord? As close as you want to. But this is the only thing I'm going to share with you. The closer you get to the Lord, the more he will ask of you. Why? Because <laughs> the Lord is determined to shape in you into the image of his son, Jesus Christ. And he has, and he's eternity minded. Most Christians are earthly minded. We are, I'm inconvenienced. I don't like this. I don't like that. He is eternity minded. He wants to do things in us that will produce glory. That will produce the character of the lamb. Will produce his nature. What is the character and the nature of the Lamb. His character is righteousness, holiness, integrity, long-suffering, patience, the fruit of the Spirit. That is his character. His nature is love, mercy, compassion. The only two words the Bible says that God is, is he is love. And he is holy. The foundations of his throne are righteousness and judgment. You see the balance? We are talking about balance the other day. God is a tremendous God of balance. And you have to have, if you have too much of one and none of the other, you become Dry, judgmental, critical, uh, you know, uh, bitter, resentful. If you have too much of the other, you become disgraceful. Not graceful, disgraceful. You become uh, corrupted, worldly, careless undisciplined, unaccountable. So, so no, that, that by itself won't do, and this by itself won't do. We have to reach the middle, the plumb line. In the old days, they used to use the plumb line. The plumb line is they would drop it, and it would go like that, and eventually it would settle right in the middle. And that would mark the place, the center of gravity. Praise God. And here in this scripture we read, 
Joshua said to the people, sanctify yourselves. In the Exodus, the Lord told Moses, take out the leaven from the house and eat all of the lamb. Not just the part that you like. You have to eat the dark meat. You have to eat the white meat. You have to eat the, 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 the loins. You have to eat the legs. You have to eat even the entails. Entrails. <laughs> oh, I don't like this part of the scripture. I'm, gonna, I'm going to skip it. Well, why don't rip it out? Let's just rip it out. I don't believe in this and this. Let's rip it out. By the time you're done, you're going to have very little left. Eat the whole lamb. Get all the leaven out of the house. Why? Why do I have to get all the leaven out of my the house? We already covered. What is the house? Who is the house? You are the house. You are the house. Why do you have to take the leaven out of the house? So that when the angel of death passes over, the destroyer, you are not touched. Because he has nothing in you. I'm going to give you a quick lesson. All right? A quick lesson in spiritual warfare. Do not open doors that you will regret later. You open a doorway, you watch the wrong thing, go to the wrong website, go to the wrong place, associate with the wrong people, and you open doors, and then you pay the consequences. <sighs> you got to get the leaven out of the house. Get all that out of the house. Apply the blood on the doorposts. Have your... Your loins, you know, have your clothes on, your shoes on, ready. Because when the Lord says, go, you have to go. Amen. It's time to cross the Jordan. Glory to the Lamb. It's all, it's, it's, it's there. It's, it's in red in the scriptures, in red. Jesus said that. Uh, and we talked about it last night, or the, I think it was Friday night. I can't remember. Or, no, well, no, it was yesterday morning. We talked about the thief in the night. How, how does a thief come? He comes st stealthily. He comes at a time you don't expect it. The Lord Jesus Christ, Yeshua, many times said, if you're on the roof of the house, don't come back to get anything. The woman, uh, the uh, uh, Lot's wife, when she came out of Sodom, she looked back. She, she kept looking back. She couldn't help look back. Why? Because there in Sodom stayed her family, her kids, her grandkids, her friends, her possessions, material possessions. She couldn't, she, she, she kept looking back, and the angel warned her, don't do that. Or you will become pillar of salt. You will be destroyed. He that seeketh to save his life shall lose it. And he that loses his life for me shall save it. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. If you seek to try to save your life in this end times, you may lose it. If you and when I when I try to when I say it's your lifestyle, it means the way you do things, your self life, your the way you do things. You don't want to give up this. You don't want to give up that. Listen to me. It's not worth holding on to, anyways. If there's anything dark in you, if you're holding to anything dark, let it go. It's not worth holding on to that junk. When the angel passes. <laughs> and, and he sees you got that. He said, oh, there's an invitation from me. Come on, come on, guys. You don't believe me? It's in the scripture. 
It's in the scripture. This is the reason why Jesus Christ said, remember when he said, the devil comes and he has nothing in me. What did he mean by that? There was no darkness in him. All he could do was try to tempt him. Temp temptation comes from the outside. You can either yield to it or not yield to it. But if there's darkness inside of you, that is a different, totally different story. Smile, Jesus loves you. Oh, praise God. And so we are living in a time, people, where we have to prepare to cross over to the Jordan. Do you know what <clears throat> the Lord told Joshua? Let me read that because this is important. He said, verse 5, sanctify yourselves for tomorrow the Lord will do wonders among you. He also said, you have not crossed, in verse 4, you have not passed this way before. To this moment, you have not passed this way. You, we are going, people, into uncharted territory. I share this yesterday, too. This next year is extremely unique. The Lord has given the, uh, the, you know, the, the, the stars in the heaven and the planets he has given to us for a sign and seasons. It's in the scripture. Jesus came and he accused, he rebuked the people saying, you cannot discern the times. When Jesus Christ Yeshua was born, not one of the Pharisees or Sadducees or any of the religious people of his day were able to discern what had just happened except the wise man from the East. Why? Because they watched the signs in the heavens. They prayed and watched. Remember, it's not enough to pray. You have to pray and watch. Pray and watch. Pray and watch. We are of the day, we are not of the night. We have to be sober about these things. Because these signs that are happening, this year we had two blood moons. On not just blood moons, but on high holidays. On Passover and tabernacles. When Jesus Christ came the first time, he fulfilled all. All the spring feasts to the T. When he comes a second time, <clears throat> he will fulfill the fall feasts to the T. This next year, we're going to have the next two blood moons. Every time there have been blood moons falling on high holidays, things have happened. In 67, 68, Jerusalem was conquered by the Israelis. They, this last century, it happened twice. First when they came back into Israel, and then when they captured Jerusalem. This year, and next year, is happening again. But this is very, very different from the others. I'm going to tell you why. Keep your eyes next year. The Lord has marked this date on his heavenly calendar with a pushpin. Why? There's this thing called the Shemitah. It happens every seven years. This is all throughout the scriptures. Every, and it used to be on the, on the seventh year of the Shemitah, it used to be a year of blessing. It, it was supposed to be a year of blessing. But because of the rebellion of the Jewish people, 
it became a year of judgment. In 2001, it was a year of Shemitah. You saw what happened to this country. That's when this country began to get away from the Lord. Prayers in the schools had stopped. Decadence, corruption. Each year has been getting worse and worse. Seven years later, 2008, the stock market crash. Still, this country rebelled and said, we shall rebuild. There was no repentance. There was no turning back to God. There was no acknowledgement of sin. On the contrary, it became more, more rebellious, more decadent, more sinful. This next year is going to be another year of Shemitah, concluding on September 3rd. That date is not only the end of the year of Shemitah, but it also is a solar eclipse. The sun shall be turned to darkness. Right around that same time, I believe it is afterwards, is also a blood moon, a tetrad falling on tabernacles. Also, not just, it's not just the, another Shemitah year, but it is the seventh Shemitah, which is followed by a year of Jubilee. A year of Jubilee means that the captives go free. And the land is returned to its rightful owner. The rightful owner takes over possession of what belongs to him. Well, this earth used to belong to Adam and Eve. The Lord gave it to Adam and Eve. Adam and Eve sinned. And it was forfeited, therefore the enemy took it, the title deed to the earth. Jesus Christ came, and through his atonement, sacri atoning sacrifice on the cross, he took back what belonged to him, the title deed. But he has not reclaimed it yet. The scroll in the book of Revelation, when the seals begin to be broken, what do you think that is? The seals begin to be broken off the scroll that was held in the hand of him that sits on the throne, and the lamb appeared next to him, slain, and he had the ability and the right and the authority to take the scroll from him that sits on the throne and begin to remove the seals thereof. What does that mean, Brother Augusto? All this hocus spoke, all this stuff about seals and judgment. It is the title deed to the earth, beloved. It's the title deed to the earth. And every time a seal is broken, is the Lord saying, I'm coming back to take what is mine. And the second seal, and the third, and the fourth, and the fifth, and the sixth. And when the seventh seal is broken and removed, the title deed to the earth begins to be read and come into possession of him that judges the living and the dead. Now, I am not saying that the Lord is coming back next year, okay? Or the year after that, 2016. I'm not, that's not what I'm saying. But what I'm saying is these things are a sign in the heavens. 
This thing is not going to happen again. I don't know for how long. I, I don't know. The year of Jubilee. The rightful owner takes possession. The captives are set free, are released. Doesn't, does that make any sense to you? <laughs> does that make any sense to the redeemed of the Lord here? Yeah. Praise God. Let's give him a praise offering. Oh, glory. What am I saying? I'm saying get ready. Get ready for the greatest battle this world has ever seen. It's a cosmic battle, a glorious battle that the enemy cannot win because the, its end has already been written before it happens. But for some reason, he thinks he can still win this thing. And not only does he think he can win this thing, he has managed to persuade others that they will win this thing. But they will not. They will not win. Because we serve a Lord who is the King of glory. He has never lost a battle In the old days, the Philistines, the Amorites, and all these Hivites, and all these tribes were terrified of the God of the valley. Of the people that had the God that dwelled in the valley, not just in the mountains, but also in the valleys. They were terrified. Because they knew. They had dealt with this before. The enemy knows the terror of the Lord. <laughs> the lion of the tribe of Judah is getting ready to roar. <laughs> Praise God. Amen. This second time, he's not coming as a meek little lamb. I was driving many years ago when I was in Miami. I closed with this. I had this bumper sticker, my brand new Honda. I bought a little Honda Civic. I bought this bumper, uh, this bumper sticker. I put it in the bumper that said, the king is coming. I was, I was totally in love with the king. I still am. The king is coming. And this, this guy, this engineer that came out of the office, and he said to me, well, he saw the bumper sticker and he said, the king is coming. He said, is that you? I said, no, that's not me. It's the Lord Jesus Christ whom I serve. He said, ah, oh, they're going to do to him the same thing they did the first time. And I said, that's where you're wrong. This time he ain't coming back as a little lamb. He's coming back as the lion of the tribe of Judah. He looked at me with, he looked at me, you know, and then went in his car and drove off. <laughs> People, get ready to cross the Jordan. We are about to go where we have never gone before. You have never crossed this way before. Never crossed this way before. And the Levites are going to be carrying the ark. And the Lord is, magnify, is going to magnify himself in his people. Can we stand to our feet? Praise God. We are living in a glorious day. A glorious day. I wouldn't trade it for anything in the world. The prophets of old longed for this day. 
They saw this day and rejoiced. Turned to someone next to you and said, you are privileged to be living in this time. What an honor. What a great honor. What did the Lord see in us that made him feel that we were able to endure this thing and to be able to do this in these end times? That he considered us worthy. It's a great honor, people. A great honor, a great privilege to be alive today. And it is something for which many are not prepared. But this is why I'm telling you this. So you be prepared. You don't have to be caught on unawares. You can be ready, prepared. With the armor on, the helmet of salvation. The boots of peace. The belt of truth. The sword. Sharpened. Sharpened, not blunt, but sharpened. And then the shield, ready, not fractured, broken down shield. Shield ready to, to go into battle. And in order to be ready for these things, I've already shared with you, it's, it's not that difficult, but you have to do this. I wonder... If maybe there are some here, you've thrown down your shield. Your sword is blunt, it's dragging. You have taken off your breastplate, your helmet you have thrown down. You're ready to give up. You don't want to go any further. Maybe, maybe you decided to take a little time out out there in the, in the wilderness. But the Lord is saying to you, come back to me now. You have wandered long enough. Come back to me now. It's time to give up your little toys. It's time to give up your little trinkets. It's time to give up your pet sins. It's time to give. Come back to me today. I will wash you. I will heal you. I will anoint you. But come back to me. Come to me. Come to me. Says the Lord, come to me. Come to me who died for you. Come to me who suffered for you. Come to me who endured things for you. Come to me and receive me unto yourself. Come to me. Come to me who gave it all. Left the heavens and came down to earth. Made himself of no reputation. Even unto a humble servant, come to me today. Do not postpone anymore. Don't delay this. We are entering very treacherous times. We are about to cross the Jordan. You do not want to be left on the other side of the Jordan. Come now. Just come if you are one, I'm talking to you. If you're the one the Lord is talking to, come to him. Come now in Jesus' name.